Welcome back everybody, Derek Sue, your East Oakland advocate. What is coming up is the actual meeting from Keith Carson's Alameda County webinar. It was open to the public. Uh, there were about 250, 280 folks that uh, joined this webinar and it is not copy copyrighted. They're also going to make the entire full um, webinar available on the Alameda County website in, in a day or so. But uh, what I have following here is specific to Oakland and what we have or who we have representing the city of Oakland and the homeless uh, office is Latonda Simmons. She's currently the temporary uh, uh, director of uh, homeless services and she also includes her contact information for those of you here in Oakland who want to talk with her directly or email her directly. It is at the uh, end of this uh, video. So thank you for, for watching. This is a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, good information. Uh, it explains the Oakland's EMP encampment management policy and how it is uh, supposed to work. And so there's a lot of good information here. It's about 43 minutes long. So enjoy. We'll be right back. Um, we have a number of slides here. We may move a bit quickly. We noticed that yeah, your slides were a little bit more lean than ours. Um, and we do recognize that in some respects, some of the conversation that we will have with you tonight uh, includes data that you already have as the county and we're somewhat preaching to the choir. So I wanna first just acknowledge and appreciate the departments. We have uh, gathered information across our departments that speaks to a spectrum um, in terms of the response that the city provides across a number of departments to respond to homelessness. And just wanna acknowledge our human services department in whole our housing and community development departments, of course, city administrator's office, but moreover, um, the civic partners and the other organizational partners that make this work possible, um, as daunting as it is, and of course, um, the community and homelessness services division was really, really putting a lot of work into this. Um, we're gonna move forward with just some general background details. I'm gonna give it to Ms. Simone Falls to be able to just frame what you all um, know about our city but share with the community here whenever you're ready so thank you you can go ahead to the next slide i think this is a fact that we all know already that homelessness is unfortunately one of the biggest issues we're facing not only in oakland but in the county as a whole go to the next slide thank you um, so this is point in time count data, which Carrie did dive into. This is specific to Oakland. And you can see that there was an increase in homelessness between the 2019 point in time count and the 2022 point in time count. One thing to note here is the decrease in the rate of increase of homelessness. So from 2017 to 2019, there was, I believe it's a 47% rate of increase of homelessness and that decreased to 24% over the next three years. And we do attribute a lot of that to many of the interventions that were stood up in response to COVID and a lot of funding that came out of um, COVID and a lot of lessons learned about what truly works to support the homeless population. Next slide. Um, this slide details, the, the main point here is showing that the city of Oakland makes up nearly 50% of the homeless population in Alameda County. So therefore, it is important that we have a large investment and robust programming in the city of Oakland. You can see here a breakdown of where people were identified as living during the point in time count. The majority of people are living in an unsheltered status shown here, 1,063 in tents and 1,031 in a car van. And what's newer to the city of Oakland over the last few years is the vast increase in people living in RV structures, both operational and non-operational RVs. 
Excellent. Um, so one thing that we know about homelessness is the disparities, the equity concerns around the populations impacted by homelessness. Both men and both Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. And this shows here that 62.9% of individuals identify as male and the majority identify as, I guess what we would call middle age. I don't know if that's still a, a, a proper term, uh, but middle age at this point. Next slide. Uh, and you saw the county breakdown of race across the whole county. This is specific to Oakland. You can see that 21% of individuals identify as Black or African American in the general population. This is according to the federal census versus a 59% who are of homeless individuals who identify as Black or African American. So you can see there is a, an equity concern here. Another equity concern that does not necessarily jump out on the page is the inability to adequately identify the percentage of individuals who identify as Latin or Hispanic as they are currently only identified as an ethnicity and not a separate race. Next slide. I think I'm passing it back to you. Yes. And at this point, we'll begin to talk about the city of Oakland's homelessness systems and the response that we've coordinated across departments. And we'll highlight, um, if you will, again, the more prominent players. Um, it is no it is no question and, of course, no surprise that homelessness touches every department in the city of Oakland in some way or some form. The particular departments in question that we will focus on specifically would be our housing and community development departments our human services department, and of course the Office of the City Administrator, most recently having established a di division of homelessness administration um, promulgated from the creation of the homelessness administrator position that was created in 2019. As we kind of go through the continuum, we'll start about, we'll start with focusing on the specific areas that each of the departments um, lend their expertise to and um, we'll begin with focusing on the prevention aspect because, of course, we know that one of the most important uh, opportunities that we have as service providers is to prevent individuals from moving into the unsheltered status. Our Human Services Department did evaluate um, with, the, with the assistance of, of a partnership with Stanford um, a, a number of interviews with our unhoused community, approximately 80 interviews that focus, excuse me, not our unhoused community, but those that were in very low and extremely low uh, income renters. Um, they, they interviewed about 80 of the individuals across the languages of English, Chinese, and Spanish to focus on understanding more deeply, you know, what the barriers are to accessing programs and finding housing. You can see uh, on the right that the interviews, the breakdown by race was 24, 22.4% Latinx, 27.6% uh, Black, 21.1% White, and then API identifying um, at 28.9%. From those conversations and within the spectrum of the housing department, um, they set forth to focus on some very specific goals that they knew uh, were elements in terms of the barriers to attaining to finding and, and sustaining um, your sustaining the ability to keep affordable housing. I'm so sorry, my coffee is wearing off. And those areas um, included legal support, uh, ways in which they could provide flexible financial payments, wraparound services to remove other barriers, and of course, the expansion of outreach. And what we know is that these same barriers, which specifically um, are root causes to homelessness here in Oakland, um, are amongst many other root causes. Um, and that's derived from the continuums of CARES racial in equity impact analysis, um, showing the number of, of barriers that absolutely impact um, sustainable access to sustainability in housing, 
um, and that create housing vulnerability, but moreover, um, promote barriers to being able to find affordable housing. And you see on the right that these three um, particular areas, displacement, um, the general representation in terms of barriers to housing, which includes discrimination, and the inability to increase one's income were unique um, root causes to Oakland. These specific initiatives in terms of the, the issues really build upon prior work. Um, Supervisor Carson spoke about the direct work with uh, our prior mayor, Libby Schaaf, and other legislators that were focused on the development of programs that would assist in these areas. And they build on prior initiatives such as Oakland Housing Secure, Keep Oakland House, and the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, and of course, HCD's goal is to target those residents most at risk with the utilization of, of, of an upcoming RFP and typically the RFPs that they have issued in the past to be able to promote uh, ways that they can come up with resources to address these root causes. We're now gonna move to intervention. Intervention is the space where the city administrator's office and the housing department and particularly though the human services department collaborate on the responses uh, um, to individuals where we find um, on the streets who are in the state of homelessness. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that in the response to homelessness, um, you know, there are specific departments that lead, but I wanted to underscore that across the city, a number of departments contribute specific responsibilities and time and resources according to their functional responsibilities to band together to address not only homelessness, but the impacts of homelessness on the environment and in, in, in a public rights of way. And that would be our encampment management team. It spans across eight departments primarily, um, already included the Department of uh, Human Services, but specifically those departments that would seek to mitigate the health and safety risks that they find in the environments um, in encampments. And the goal of this work is to stabilize um, the environment, to mitigate again those health and safety interventions, the, those health and safety elements that uh, pose greater danger to the unhoused community and even those neighbors nearby, but also to utilize this as an opportunity to mobilize um, shifting our unhoused members into interventions that can improve the conditions that they're experiencing or the quality of life that they're experiencing. And those that work is um, a joint effort at this stage of the work, predominantly led by the encampment management team, but really utilizing the expansive services that are made available to us by our human services department. Um, and this is just another slide to really talk about the encampment management policy um, in its introduction in terms of its most recent passage in 2020. There have been a number of questions that, you know, that focused on what the intent of the policy is. Well, the policy's intent is to um, assist both sheltered and unsheltered residents and to manage the adverse impacts of homeless encampments by balancing the interests of both the unhoused and the, and the residents that near, live nearby and the businesses as well. And this is because we do know that, you know, the ability to close an encampment and, and the ability to solve for homelessness involves there needing to be affordable housing and additional shelter spaces to be able to shift people from where they are into these interventions. Um, this is sort of also the Martin B. Voise conundrum um, that's related to the Ninth Circuit Court District here that says that before we could close an encampment, we must have a place for people to go. And so that absolutely is, is structurally um, significant in terms of the work that the encampment management team uh, is able to do. Um, this focuses on encampments with respect to mitigating those negative outcomes. And again, I talked about those health and safety conditions which are about 13 identified health and safety conditions according to the policy that range from environmental issues as well as uh, health issues, um, biological health issues. And so this is where the policy um, serves to be a pathway to assisting the community into moving into a different space. The policy focuses on high and low sensitivity areas 
um, areas where the concentration of homelessness and the impacts and the elements of homelessness have more of a greater adverse impact to the community there and those surrounding it. Um, it focuses on ways of better managing those areas that would be considered low sensitivity zones, um, but providing services to support those that would be in those areas. Um, we talked about the findings, um, which consist of about 13 different health and safety findings as, long, as well as specific proximity determinants that, um, that serve as the criteria to advance the team into moving into areas to resolve encampment issues. And specifically though, more than anything, um, it's not solely focused on infrastructure. We recognize that while we are addressing the conditions there, that it is also our obligation to meet the needs of the unhoused. And so these are the moments when we have an opportunity, of course, as we address infrastructure, to use these resources connected to our human services department and even our partners here at the county to transition from these, to transition individuals from these encampments into better spaces. And this is also where what I, I call the, the, the very rich work of learning how to meet the needs of individuals so that we can take that learning back and, and contribute it into the spaces such as these so that we can develop strategies that better serve the community uh, centered in equity and specifically harm reduction, noting that, that for each activity that we perform out there, we have a community that is filled with trauma based on the things that they're experiencing on the street as well as those that have encroached into the encampment environments and are sort of um, taking advantage of our unhoused as they are in, in encampment environments. With that, since the launch of the 2020 encampment management policy, the city has instituted as of September approximately 361 closures and deep cleanings. We've expanded our sanitation support uh, focused on regular garbage runs and containerized garbage runs to approximately 7,000 at the end of September for a total of about 7,300 interventions as of that date. Um, what we don't have here, and I failed to include it, would be a comparison of the work that had been performed before this policy was expanded. And that would be that, you know, approximately 200 closures had uh, been executed maybe about two years ago between 2018 up to 2020 and maybe about 1,500 mm -hmm. garbage runs but it speaks to the amount of, of, of suppression uh, activity that has been performed under the current policy. And what I would tell you to date is that we're probably at approximately 400 and about 40 interventions having, having um, focus on closures, partial closures, um, reclosures, and even deep cleanings. And I would say our regular garbage pickups and runs are at approximately, just probably beneath 9,000 at, at this point. Those activities were expanded by way of additional investments that were made into the encampment management team, um, expanding our keep, keep Oakland Clean and Beautiful support, and that would be our public works division, adding painters to be able to give us some uh, ability to power wash areas, um, expanding our human services department by adding two case managers to be able to assist with navigation support and, and engagement with the unhoused community. Of course, expanding the Homelessness Administrative Division by adding a program analyst too and another admin assistant, adding additional investments across our other departments, which includes parks um, and sanitation in terms of the Homelessness Administration dollars to be able to expand that work, additional dollars to expand trash, pick up for the public works team, and specifically um, for sanitation services, while it's regarded as sanitation services here, it would be an expansion of team support. These dollars actually translated into additional public work staff to be able to add to the suppression activities that the city had prescribed in its encampment management policy. And that included additional components such as hotel vouchers to be, oh, excuse me, hotel dollars to be able to support unique interventions where the interventions um, as, as they're related, as they're regarded in the field, the deep cleanings and closures. Um, when we are matching needs to our unhoused community, sometimes the resources in terms of the availability of shelter um, and housing is so low that we often will have to place people in hotels 
until such time that we can have interventions and, serve, and program, active, program slots made available for them. And then, of course, there have been other stipends associated with um, the homelessness, uh, actually our Commission on Homelessness, which is uh, most recently a body that has been instituted to be able to provide us with guidance and oversight in terms of encampment management and homelessness spending. In addition to that, um, those investments um, were ancillary to these additional contributions that have been made, and that would be standing up many more interventions to be able to provide people places to go. Um, Estelle, if you'll allow me, I'm prepared to really let you do this slide. Your team is really led in the intervention space in terms of standing up these interventions. Would you like to cover this? I'm sorry, Simone. <laughs> yeah, I see Estelle is here though. No, she her. raised her hand. <laughs> um, no worries. Yes, yeah, so we have added uh, additional programming over the last couple of years. Specifically here, you'll see that in fiscal year 21-22, we added another RV safe parking site. It added 40 slots in West Oakland for people residing in RVs. On East 12th, we have uh, a cabin navigation center. And third and Peralta, we also have a cabin navigation center. Those are two sites that are short-term interim housing for people residing on the street that are looking for shelter and support. That includes housing navigation and on-site staff and security. Then we also have Lau family that opened up at the CARE campus in East Oakland. This is nearby the Project Room, Room Key Hotels, if you're familiar with those, it is in that same area. And that is transitional housing that includes a workforce component. And this is intended to rapidly transition people to permanent housing once they've acquired um, employment. This latest fiscal year, we've added Beach Street, another RV safe parking site, and two programs coming in the next month, Wood Street Community Cabins, it's another navigation center alongside the Wood Street um, area of West Oakland, and then 66th Avenue safe parking is also an RV safe parking site in the East Oakland area of the city. So adding approximately what a little over 300 units, um, almost 400 in fact, um, in terms of shelter spaces to give people options, um, as well as maintaining the, the approximately, what is it, forgive me, it's, forgive me, Simone, I feel like it's another 16 programs that are, um, that have been stood up by our human services department. So a substantial investment um, and a substantial amount of support um, in providing crises beds um, to ensure that people have a place to go. Structural considerations for improving this specific work absolutely um, lend to the increase of the inventory of transitional and permanent supportive housing. Um, we recognize that crisis beds are a short-term answer, but the goal is to deliver people to housing. And what we do know is that while we have stood up a substantial number of crisis beds, um, you know, it is important that those beds serve us such that they can cycle and support other members of the community. And by having more transitional and permanent housing at the income levels, it would be sustainable for these individuals. Um, we can improve the flow through system. We're also focusing on improving our levels of outreach and our system navigation and our specific outcomes. Um, just recognizing that the calibration of the encampment management policy is just a policy standard for how we will clean and clear, but we are also focused on the expansion of support and the recalibration of some of our programs in our human services department to ensure that we are targeting equity uh, needs as it relates to the community and that we are also, sorry about that, that we are also um, ensuring that people move through systems successfully. Um, and then of course, you know, ensuring that individuals are connected with our county, state and federal resources. Um, I wanna call out um, the county and, and Carrie Abbott and like um, and many partners there who have done some tremendous work with us. One of the most noteworthy um, endeavors that we collaborated on 
related to the closure of Wood Street in terms of state property. And it was a, it was the most expansive area of the Wood Street uh, encampment area. And at the closure of it, as it was promulgated by the state um, Caltrans, um, the county was able to work so very closely with the City of Oakland Human Services Department to come up with the resources to ensure that those individuals that were being moved off those spaces had the opportunity to receive housing and shelter offers, um, to receive services, um, and to get the attentive need um, to be able to help them through the transition of moving from one space um, into others. And it was a substantial amount of work. Um, it was a massive endeavor. I think the engagement uh, included uh, um, outreach to more than 200 individuals, um, expanding from uh, the, the deeper portions of the state property, which, which is in expanse about a two mile long swath uh, and about a quarter mile wide onto the city of Oakland rights of way. And so that was a huge win and an incredible collaboration. And we're thankful for the work that was put in. And then the last piece, of course, would be that in these massive endeavors with our in-house community, we want to make sure that we are in alignment and, and um, tracking our system performance and really monitoring those metrics to ensure that we're achieving the outcomes that we're seeking. And we know that the coordinated entry system is essential in this work, and this is where I'll, I'll hand it back over to Simone. Thank you. So Carrie touched on coordinated entry quite a bit. We do, um, this is one way that we coordinate with the County of Alameda around placing individuals into long-term housing solutions. So for example, our Henry and Holland transitional housing um, locations go through the coordinated entry system in order to identify individuals who are in need of that type of support. Transitional housing is a great program for um, the unsheltered population. It is a program that allows you to stay in one location um, for a, a duration of up to two years with on-site supportive services. Uh, coordinated entry is something that we um, look forward to being able to work more closely with the county. We recently transitioned completely um, completely working underneath the county. We previously did have coordinated entry within Oakland specifically. And so I think it's a good fit that we're able to work more collabor collaboratively with the county on this um, HUD mandated process. And I'm also excited about the transitional age youth access point that was recently added. And I think I don't want to give too much time to this. I know we're running out of time, but Yes, thank you. And of course, the goals of our human services department, and as we uh, as we launch these interventions, are to close racial disparities, race, racial disparities. I'm sorry, and injuries too, and exits from homelessness. Um, we just recognize that there's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done um, to be able to improve systems. But the goal, obviously, is to ensure that fewer people either become homeless and also to maintain and increase our crisis beds. Um, we recognize that there's some economic changes that are forthcoming and it could be a contributor to our unhoused population and we're deeply concerned about that. And we wish to rehouse people as quickly as we can and stabilize their incomes and address the other root causes of unsheltered homelessness. You wanna go here? Sure, and also just on the previous slide, I did wanna note that the city of Oakland is also in partnership with the county on the home together plan that Carrie described. So we we are um, aligned in that area and working collaboratively to move towards meeting those goals. This slide here describes many of the different interventions that we uh, fund in the city of Oakland. Our crisis beds are typically um, speaking to our navigation centers, often known as community cabins our safe parking sites, our emergency brick and mortar shelters such as SBDP and Crossroads as in addition to our family shelters. And that goes along with our emergency shelters. I like to point out here our emergency shelters, we do have two interventions that were stood up in um, direct 
response to COVID, we have our Lake Merritt Lodge and our home base site. Home base is our trailer site meant for individuals who are identified as vulnerable to COVID and Lake Merritt Lodge is an old dorm across the street from Lake Merritt. It's a beautiful site and it also serves people who are vulnerable to the effects of COVID. We have several health and hygiene sites. Our case managers manage uh, sites, encampment sites by providing hygiene services such as porta potties, hand washing stations, and also mobile showers. We also have stationary shower units that we are beginning to place at all of our sites. We've been placing them at our new sites and are working towards adding them to our pre-existing sites. Housing navigation is part of our programs. It's um, the goal, of course, is to one, have a safe place for people to be able to sleep and lay their head and have a place to be able to focus on their next needs, but also to be able to help people transition into permanent housing. So that's where our housing navigation comes in in partnership with our programs. OPRI is um, a Oakland initiative. It is rapidly housing people from the street directly into permanent housing. There are some steps that may take place depending on the assessment. There may be uh, an initial stay in shelter and that then transitions to rapid rehousing. But you do have the option to move directly into rapid rehousing. Permanent housing interventions go through coordinated entry for the county. So we do support that process and we work with the county in order to um, transition people from our programs directly into permanent supportive housing and that process goes through the access points uh, where people go through the coordinated entry assessment and are able to then be matched to units where they can reside for the remainder of their time. Rapid rehousing is similar to transitional housing. It's scattered sites, so there are not on-site services, and it's intended for people who are able to work and able to increase their income and eventually pay for their housing independently. HMOP is our street outreach team. We do have street outreach in Oakland that works independently and in collaboration with the city, with the county of Alameda. Um, county, county of Alameda has street teams and we also work with our um, local clinics. So they all work collaboratively, collaboratively together and we are working on enhancing those um, partnerships as well to ensure that um, information is shared adequately and Massey Transitional Housing, which I did speak to earlier. Next slide. This is reconstitutes it a different way, I know. Yes, this slide, it's the um, same information, but does give specifics to programs that we do manage. I will just highlight a few of them here. So um, Youth Spirit Artworks is a program that we fund at our Hagenberger site. We also help fund the Covenant House Transitional Housing Rapid Rehousing Programs. Those are two transitional age youth projects. Uh, we fund our Lake Mare Lodge and Home Base, which I spoke to, which is for vulnerable individuals. Um, we fund the, the Holland and the Henry are in Transitional Housing Programs. St. Vincent de Paul is a congregate shelter, uh, which is and Crossroads is as well, which are important projects to note because sometimes people need low, very, very low barrier services, which these shelters both provide. And sometimes people also just need a, a, a break for the night, which is okay if you wanna come into the shelter for a night or two. And so that this is a program that allows for those conditions where programs such as transitional housing are not built for that type of um, shelter. Uh, I'll leave it there. It's a lot of programs, many, many programs that we fund and we're um, still looking to expand knowing that the need is great and we're, we're um, still working to meet that need. All right, so these are our outcomes. This gives an example of exits in the system. And I have some other um, outcomes I want wanted to share as well. You can see here permanent housing exits from all of our programs show 481 compared to 380 to homelessness, homeless outcomes exits rather. 
And I just wanted to know the difference between two of our programs. So I did just state that St. Vincent de Paul and Crossroads, sometimes those programs serve as just short term one or two night stays for people, which is just fine. And sometimes they may be longer term stays, which lead to permanent housing. So if you split look at the programs differently, where there are long term programs such as transitional housing and rapid rehousing, the exits to permanent housing are at 76 percent versus exits to homelessness from those programs are at 5%. Now, if you look at our crisis bed interventions, such as our navigation centers and our emergency shelters, exits to permanent housing are 24% and exits to homelessness are 45%. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a breakdown of our funding. It's a large scale breakdown. So it's showing that the majority of our funds are one time, one time funds. It's a big point to make there. A lot of our funds come from the state. A lot of our funds towards homelessness are HAP funds and they are not guaranteed to continue year after year. So we must plan on a short term basis without knowing what may, come, may or may not come in the coming years. We have recently applied and received the encampment resolution fund, which is funding our um, Wood Street cabin site. And we continue to seek additional funding opportunities to be able to enhance our programming and um, add to our programming. And I would just say, and, and we'll move quickly through the remaining slides because we know we're coming to time, is that we have a, we have a problem uh, recognizing that it is long-term and enduring and both cities and counties have been placed in the position of seeking competitive resources for you know, short-term dollars, if you will, for long-term structural problems. And that's an opportunity for us to align so that we can actually move metrics and really speak to um, perhaps our state partners to compel them to de dedicate some ongoing resources to this kind of work. What we do know is that it takes a substantial amount of time to acquire and or build housing. And what we see is that with the disproportionate impact to the African-American community, by the time that they would have to endure the number of years in current status on the streets, they may not even be alive to have the opportunity to engage those housing opportunities. And that's something that requires a level of urgency across all organizations. The, disp the disproportionate impact to our African-American community and our Latinx community and seeing the numbers that correlate with what the county put out most recently in its mortality report with 55% of those individuals dying in the state of homelessness in the streets. That is a call for concern. That is a crisis call and nothing underscores an emergency in my opinion more than that. So just quickly, of course, the back end of the process would be that once we move people through homelessness mitigation, that we're able to place them in permanent housing. Of course, coordinated entry is essential and also the placement of people in permanent housing. But we recognize that across the state, most certainly in, the, in our city, that there is a dearth, if you will, of affordable housing units. And so I just wanted to point that out and just talk about the strategies that the, the housing department is embarking upon in terms of what they're currently using as strategies for placement. Um, of course, they're working with the Housing Authority, the Housing and Community Development Department itself through the programs that it writes up and, and the dollars that it competes for. And of course, our Human Services Department with the strategies on rapid rehousing. In addition, the Housing Department uses its NOFA to be able to administer funds for housing development. And current NOFAs include the use of Home Key, for rapid acquisition and conversion to construction, creation of multifamily affordable uh, rental, and, and scoring prioritizes projects with more dedicated ELI and PSH units in neighborhoods experiencing displacement and emerging developments and emerging developers. And those go to some of those core concerns that were identified as root causes. Um, acquisition and conversion to affordable housing converts market rate rental to affordable with set aside for co-ops and land, land trusts and of course preservation supports rehab needs of existing portfolio buildings. Here's some of the numbers that relate to the, the production in our housing department. I won't 
go into them in great detail. I'm trying to move a little bit more quickly, recognizing the amount of time that we've taken, but we will also share these slides after this presentation. And then, of course, this also details the specific sources, and you'll see from the fiscal year 21-22 budget across all resources, you know, based on some of the emergency dollars also that were made available, you know, the housing department had $36,714,927, but in the 22-23 budget, we're seeing $24,118,865. Now, this does not speak to the uh, dollars that will come from Measure U that was successfully passed this November that will deliver some money to support this work. Um, the staff is currently working on a spending plan um, to ensure that those dollars have a significant, the most significant impact to this work. So our core focus areas, and, and we're down to the last slide for the most part, is to work on implementing improvements to systems and operations, to expand our resources across the continuum to increase extremely and very low affordable housing um, services from our human services department and that of our housing department and even our encampment management teams, and to increase the staffing to support those needs. Importantly, it's, it's also critical that we measure our progress the system's performance and those outcomes, that we center these strategies in equity, and that we also include the expansion of health services for the Oakland homeless community. Um, just noting that the governor did sign off on, on the bill that focuses on um, care court, but recognizing that the implementation did not include Alameda County and will not uh, reach this county until I, I feel like it's 2025, if I'm not mistaken by the legislation, um, and, and there's tremendous need here. I will say though that as that policy is deployed and that program is deployed, I would hope that the county and the city will take upon the opportunity to look also at the other parts of systemic racism where such tools could have also another disproportionate impact on the African American community who are suffering from trauma, suffering from homelessness, but should not necessarily have their rights and privileges be taken away and their autonomy taken away without sufficient um, without sufficient exploration into their needs and not simply putting them as wards of the court for the purposes of simply moving them off the streets. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And of course, there's the expand, expanding interest in, of course, our housing development strategy. And I just want to say, and, and we're about done, um, this continuum that we talk about um, and, and I would hope that the supervisor could deeply appreciate these comments, really reflect what local jurisdictions and counties have had to kind of put together at the loss of redevelopment agency dollars. No one wants to talk about it. It's a bit of a Washington monument, but what I do know is California, I'm born and raised here. California has been unaffordable the entire time California has been California. And what we do know is redevelopment agency dollars were absolutely essential in stabilizing affordability and at least keeping local pipelines from municipal governments in terms of the development of affordable housing moving. And the loss of that bears a correlation to the escalation of homelessness. And I think that we should study that and talk about it and also elevate those disproportionate impacts as well. So our strategies include aggregating our resources to combine forces and dollars so that we can approach um, addressing the homelessness issues um, and those absolutely more deeply impacted by homelessness um, centered in principles of equity. And, and with this strategy, we look forward to continuing to work with the county. Um, we'll include in the slides and share the slides the ways in which you can contact the city departments for any questions that you may have or needs that you may have across the spectrum and the departments that support this work. And we want to thank you for giving us certainly a few more minutes than you had planned um, to, to walk through all of our slides. I just thank wanted you. to say also to close out, thank you for having me as well and just that we know that Homelessness requires intentional and impactful coordination, and we're working doing that within the city and working on enhancing that and look forward to continuing to also enhance our collaboration with the county. And I did want to appreciate Supervisor Carson's comment about the partnership with Council Member Cobb and continuing to see those partnerships grow, knowing that that is how we will enhance um, our the work that we're doing. So it's just great to hear that that's happening already. Thank you.